So now to sort of round out this lecture, we're going to be going over the specific types of land plants that we mentioned in the previous video when we looked at the origin and diversification of plants. We're going to begin this discussion by looking at the oldest ones, and those are the bryophytes. So we'll entitle this first flowchart on the plants specifically as bryophytes 1. So if we remember, bryophytes are the moss plants essentially, and we can give them a, a very short descriptive category basically that they fall under would be the fact that they are usually going to be small and rather herbaceous plants. And I'll explain what that means. Herbaceous simply means non-woody. So they will not have any sort of stalk, stem, long sort of growing pattern. They're just going to be small herbaceous plants. And that's the basic way to describe any bryophyte. And they fall under three major phyla. So three phyla, and the three phyla are uh, things that we've already actually covered, and we'll just reiterate the liverworts are one phyla of the bryophytes. Another one would be the mosses. General moss that you see would be another phyla, and then also hornworts would be the last phyla. Now these both, all three of these have more specific names. The liverworts are more commonly or scientifically referred to as the hepatophyta. Um, hepato is the root for liver, so it makes sense, hepatophyta, uh, liver plants. So liverworts is hepatophyta, you might see that. Mosses are seen usually as bryophyta sometimes. And then hornworts can be seen as the uh, anthocerophyta. Okay, so be familiar with the scientific names. These are the more common names, and I'm going to stick with those. Now, the one thing that uh, underlies all of these is the fact that, and it's absolutely true, that these are the earliest lineages of land plants. Earliest lineages of land plants. And that's why we're doing them first in terms of coverage, what they consist of, really. So these are the oldest, thus they're probably the most closely related to the carophytes, right? Those uh, very ancestral green algae protists that we talked about. Okay, so now that we have the phyla in place, let's look at some characteristics, some key structure and function of bryophytes. First and foremost, I want to mention that these are very, very much non-vascular plants. Plants became vascular a lot later, okay? Vascularity is a big, big evolutionary successful trait, but at first, land plants were non-vascular, the bryophytes specifically. This means that the plant must be small. You cannot be a large non-vascular plant. It just doesn't work like that. You can't transport goods throughout the plant if you're large, if you don't have a vascular system. So you're going to have to be small, and you're going to have to stay small until you develop a vascular system, which we'll see. In addition, you have to rely on uh, some simple processes for your uh, absorption and uh, maintenance of, let's say, water content. And that's specifically on diffusion and osmosis. So you're not going to be able to transfer water great distances. You have to make sure the water is relatively close and relatively easily able to diffuse across the cell membrane. Um, so there's a lot of proximity to water because of these reliances on diffusion and osmosis. So of course, non-vascular bryophytes need a moist environment as well. So they either need to be near water or very close to water. Though these are land plants, they just simply need to have some sort of water environment. At least some sort of component of it has to have some sort of moisture. And that's also going to allow for the fact that these non-vascular plants must utilize, and they do utilize, um, flagellated sperm for their reproductive process. Because flagellated sperm, when you have something that's flagellated, it means that it is going to be motile. But that motility is useless unless it is within some sort of medium, some sort of way that the motility can actually function. This would mean that these flagellated sperm need water to move. So this is what we mean by the transition to land, right? You don't absolutely become the tallest trees ever the moment you are a carophyte and you turn into a plant, right? You actually have to have a slow progression. This is evolution in a nutshell. It's a slow progression towards more success, towards more advanced or uh, more capable plants. Right now we're at no a very low stage of capability in terms of land plants. They're non-vascular for these many reasons that we established already. Okay, so that uh, gives us our non-vascularity. Now what we're going to do is something that's always confusing to a lot of students. Trust me, what you have to focus on are the general ideas of the moss life cycle. There's going to be a lot on this life cycle. We're going to go from gametophyte to sporophyte, back to sporophyte, back to gametophyte, etc. So just keep in mind the big picture as I go through this, okay? So the first thing that we'll do um, uh, is the moss life cycle, aka the bryophyte life cycle. 
So this will be the first part to this. Okay, so there'll be a couple parts to understand this life cycle that I'll separate at certain key points. First point of the moss life cycle that we're going to start at is at the sporophyte stage. Let's imagine we have a sporophyte. Remember, a sporophyte is diploid in its structure and it produces spores via meiosis. Okay, so I'll tell you that that happens. A sporophyte makes spores. Okay, so a sporophyte moss in the sporophyte stage makes some spores that are haploid. Okay, makes sense, something we've already established. Now, what's going to happen is these spores are going to germinate, aka they'll land somewhere and hopefully they'll germinate, they'll actually grow if the habitat is suitable. So I'll write that down as germinate in suitable habitat. And that would mean that they would grow via mitosis, in other words. Okay, so I'll write that down as well. So that's an extension of the germinate, grow via mitosis. Now, what is the stipulation? This must be a suitable habitat. It's not going to germinate. It's not going to grow via mitosis unless the habitat is suitable. What's the habitat that's probably suitable? Something that's relatively moist. And that's where we see most of the time the moss that we see, you know, all over the earth. Okay, so let's say that is good. We're growing via mitosis. We found a suitable habitat. What's next? There are two main components that are going to comprise the next sort of step of this life cycle. And they are as follows. This growing uh, moss right now is going to form a structure known as a protonema. Protonema. Okay, so that's a term you should remember. And protonema is just going to be defined as a filament of cells. So a filament is usually an extension, a growing uh, of cells, okay? A specific growing of cells that are haploid. So it's a filament structure that forms as a result of this germination and growing via mitosis. So you get this nice sort of shoot, this filament called the protonema. In addition, you will also get the following, okay? So in addition, if you germinate, if you grow via mitosis, you'll also get a, you'll get a protonema, but you also will form these structures known as buds. Okay, you will form buds, and buds are going to form also via mitosis. So both structures, commonal commonality between them is that they uh, are formed via mitosis. So the buds and the protonema via mitosis. Here, what's going to happen is, this is the distinction, the buds will actually eventually create gametophores. Okay, so that's a new term as well. So the buds eventually develop into these structures known as gametophores. Okay, remember where we started, sporophyte? Now we're at this gametophore structure. You might already be thinking, what's next? And the next idea is the fact that we will eventually get a gametophyte. Remember, moss, their dominant life cycle stage is actually the gametophyte, which we'll establish a little bit later. But right now, we're getting closer and closer to becoming a gametophyte. What did we start as? A sporophyte. Okay, so now from this, when we say gametophore, all you need to think of is something that produces, it's a gamete that produces, a gamete producing spores, okay? This is going to be a structure that's going to produce gametes in the form of spores. Okay, so what's going to happen is these two structures are actually going to combine together. So I'm going to put a plus sign between both of them and put an extension here. And essentially what we're going to have is a protonema, which is the filament of cells, right? It's going to combine with this uh, gametophore structure. Okay, the spore producing structure, this gametophore structure will also combine. This is going to give us one large structure called the body of the moss. And the body of the moss specifically is going to be referred to as the gametophyte now. The moss is officially a gametophyte when you have the combination of a protonema and a gametophore. This gives us the body of moss gametophyte. So we have altered our generation. Okay, our generation started as a sporophyte, now we are at a true gametophyte generation. Okay, what does this encompass? Let's move forward right over here. Moss life cycle continued. Okay, so we have this start, this is our starting point now for our continuation of the life cycle. Remember where we started, at this sporophyte point, now we're at the gametophyte point. So let's see what happens here. So, continued. What's going to happen is, uh, and this is something I briefly mentioned, is the fact that the, the gametophyte generation and I'm calling it a generation because we alternate between generations. Remember I said they undergo alternation of generations, land plants? These bryophytes are no exception to that rule. The gametophyte generation is going to be the dominant stage of the bryophyte life cycle. So something you should remember is that bryophytes live mainly in the gametophyte stage of their alternation of generations. Okay, Dominant stage of life cycle. Okay, so if this is the dominant stage of the life cycle, what does this encompass? What does it mean to be a gametophyte? Well, this means that you, as a gametophyte, this structure lives entirely independently 
of a sporophyte structure. Okay, so a sporophyte structure, we'll see a little bit later in the next video actually, a sporophyte structure cannot live without a gametophyte, but a gametophyte can live without a sporophyte. Yes, both structures are in a moss. A moss has both parts to it, okay? We'll get to the distinction in the next video, but right now just know that the gametophyte can live on its own without a sporophyte. This will be different when we get to the sporophyte stage, when we round off this life cycle, okay? It's a cycle, right? So we're going to get back to the sporophyte stage. So, lives independently of sporophyte. Also, the gametophyte generation uh, possesses these things called rhizoids, so that's just a term to know. Rhizoids are simply going to be anchors of the moss, okay? Um, specifically, also remember that they're not roots, okay? Roots are part of vascular plants, so we are not looking at vascular plants. We're looking at non-vascular plants, but we do have some sort of anchor to the ground, and that would be rhizoids. So these are our anchors that keep us uh, steadfast. Okay, now let's continue our sort of look at the generation, the gametophyte generation. How does it develop? What happens to it? So what's going to happen is if we look at the tips of the gametophyte shoots, so at tips of, let me rewrite that, of the gametophyte shoots, okay? So those are just the extensions, the growing extensions that are going towards the uh, the sky, let's say, as opposed to the anchors that are going towards the ground. At the tips of the gametophyte shoots, you're going to have two structures that should be pretty you should be pretty familiar with. The antheridium is going to be one structure, and the other structure will be the archegonium. And these of course are going to produce very important gametes, gametophyte gametes are going to be produced here. At the gametophyte generation, the antheridium will produce a sperm, and this is all within the same plant, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. The archegonium will produce the egg. This is the female part, this is the male part. These both are going to combine. Whenever you see sperm plus egg, you know immediately that means what? Fertilization, and that's right. So we have fertilization. Okay, did we have fertilization in this initial structure here? No, we did not. We just had this combination of protonema and gametophore to give us the gametophyte. No fertilization, no combination, just mitosis, okay? So we have a fertilization event here. This would mean that the flagellated sperm, let's say, swims through the water towards the egg. So we're going to go sperm into the archegonium, and that's going to combine with the egg to give us a fertilized zygote, right? So this is going to create a zygote. And let's say this, I'll write down over here, you can write down uh, through water. So the sperm will flow through H2O towards the archegonium and fertilize the egg at the archegonium. Remember that, we're at the archegonium at the moment of fertilization. So we have a zygote that forms. A zygote, of course, will be N plus N, which would be 2N. And this zygote remains in the archegonium. Okay, so this zygote has to develop. Remember, plants have to have some sort of development also. The zygote remains in the archegonium. So I'll write that down as R. Hopefully I can fit this here. Archegonium. There we go. Okay, it remains in the archegonium. That means it develops in the archegonium. And what does it do? In the archegonium, the zygote grows via mitosis. So whenever you see growth right now, Think what comes after that. It seems like every time you see growing in plants, that growing is via mitosis. So that's a commonality to remember. So this zygote grows via mitosis in the archegonium, eventually into a multicellular embryo. And that's something we established before, that plants, land plants specifically, get these multicellular embryos that are dependent on their, let's say, uh, plant that they're growing in because they're going to get the nutrients. We'll look at that in the next video in a little bit more detail. But right now, don't get tripped up on the idea that you go sporophyte to gametophyte and the fertilization is happening. What's going on? Just be aware that the sporophyte is where we're starting. We eventually create a st structure called the gametophore that combines with the protonema to give us the gametophyte. The gametophyte has its own very specific uh, orientations, and specifically these are going to result in the sperm and egg fertilization, which leads to a multicellular embryo forming. Now, we'll continue this life cycle story in the next video and then sum up why bryophytes are actually useful to us, which you might be wondering, and I'll definitely try to prove that to you as much as I can.